I'm Deborah Britzman. I'm sitting here at uh, the University of British Columbia, uh, visiting for two weeks, teaching a seminar on Freud and education. And then I go back to my home in Toronto, where I am a professor at York University. And also, I have a small private practice in psychoanalysis. I did my graduate work at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, both the master's and the doctoral work. And I was a high school teacher before that. And before that, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Massachusetts. Um, I finished my doctoral studies in um, 1985. And then I went to the State University of New York at Binghamton. I was there for seven years. And then I went to York University, and I've been at York University now for 17 years. It was quite accidental, really. Um, after teaching in high school for seven years, I began to understand all that I didn't know. And I had uh, um, nightmares, actually. Uh, about teaching and felt that there was something that um, I had to think about differently uh, outside of uh, the school. So I took a year off and just read and then went to graduate school originally to uh, do um, a master's degree in reading because um, my area was English. Uh, I, I was an English in high school, uh, I was an English teacher and one of the things that shocked me, uh, I don't know why that was the case, but I was quite shocked that uh, a great many of my students couldn't read. And I was also more shocked that I didn't know how to help them. So originally I went to do a master's degree in reading and anthropology, and I thought at, after that I would go back to uh, the school, and uh, at that point I thought maybe in administration. I found that um, schools are closed shops. It's very, very hard for an outsider that doesn't live in the neighborhood, that doesn't come from anywhere, to just suddenly go somewhere to work at a school. Um, I decided as well that might as well stay at uh, the university and for the doctoral work and studied uh, ethnographic uh, research and um, uh, continued in um, looking at reading and literacy. And when I finished the doctorate, um, I applied to uh, higher education and received my first job at the State University of New York at Binghamton as an assistant professor, and that was in 1985. And when did you start to first get interested in psychoanalysis? I was... Um, I began to think about psychoanalysis differently probably in my fourth or fifth year teaching at the university at SUNY Binghamton, began to read Freud. And then when I moved to Canada, I realized that uh, all of my areas of expertise, we put those in quotation marks, were irrelevant because they were so grounded in uh, the U.S. context. And so I needed to create a new area of study that wasn't um, dependent upon nation. And then I became uh, more and more interested in uh, psychoanalysis. And so I started reading in psychoanalysis. I went into my own analysis and then decided um, during my analysis that I would like to know more about the clinical side. I was very interested in the theoretical side of psychoanalysis, but I was also very, very interested in the clinical side. So I decided to train um, as an analyst. So um, around uh, eight years ago, I began to train as a psychoanalyst, which involved um, doing work in a clinic. And um, I started working with um, a team in a clinic that serves parents and kids and I worked with a team of people, psychiatric students, social workers, people interested in learning more about clinical practice, um, psychologists, psychoanalysts, and we were involved in assessing kids 
um, which was a very long and drawn out process. But of course, when you're working with kids, you're also working with their families. And so began to learn how to listen um, psychologically to people's experiences in their lives and how they make sense of it. Um, I entered a psychoanalytic institute and began training in earnest and started a small private practice and um, finished the program and now have the designation psychoanalyst as well as the distinguished research professor which is my title at uh, York University. So I carry a very small private practice and um, I also teach at the university and I do quite a bit of writing and the other part of my uh, work I would say I my fifth book has just come out it's called um, <clears throat> the very thought of education uh, psychoanalysis in the impossible professions and that's brand new that's out and I'm now working on a new book um, an introductory uh, text called um, I don't know what the title is but um, it's a text about Freud and education it's a text about Freud's education and ours. Um, and it's really uh, a look at what happened to the concept of education in psychoanalysis. Uh, in 1972, I went to the University of Massachusetts as an undergraduate. I had spent two years at the University of Cincinnati. And when I went to the University of Massachusetts, I met someone, a friend of mine, who's still an old friend of mine, who introduced me to two ideas, anarchism and Paulo Freire. And she gave me as a present, right after we met, a little book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And that was a book that uh, was so um, surprising because so much of education was oriented towards, uh, I would say, a technocratic uh, understanding and a compliance to the mechanisms of school life. No one really had talked about the idea that um, education oppresses. Um, we felt that way, but the idea that there was an existential dilemma to the problem of education and to the problem of literacy and to the problem of being able to tell your own story in very general terms. It, it, it wasn't an idea that I had thought about before. And so what this book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, did, and it had just been translated, so it, it came out in 1970 in English um, from the Portuguese. Portuguese and um, it was uh, I don't know how to say it but it was a book that made a terrific difference in the way in which I started to think and it was a very hard book not because the sentences were long and complicated but because of what uh, Freire was uh, trying to talk about and that was the idea of a prison house um, that was created socially, that was internalized. In this sense, it's a very psychological study of what it means to not be able to read. And the reading wasn't a reading that was a physical reading because we could read the words, but the actual problem of meaning in education that it the paradox of education is that you can spend years and years there and come out thinking you're stupid or you can spend years and years there and feel nothing means anything or you can spend years and years there and hate reading um, you can spend years and years there and feel that uh, you don't belong um, with pedagogy of the oppressed uh, suddenly what enters into lang what enters into education is language the problem of language the, the problem of speech which wasn't ever spoken about in that particular way because reading was seen, normally speaking, as, you know, a, a technical endeavor. And um, Freire offers the idea that there's an existential, there's a libidinal relation 
to um, the ways in which we take in um, meaning. And it matters to not only how we live our lives, but in how we can see the world. And so the reading, he sort of liberated reading from print and put it into the problem of interpretation and therefore made literacy an interpretive art, which is very close to what Freud did with language as well. I, I think about that now. Um, I don't see those two views as, as, um, as at odds with one another. Freire, I think, was very interested in the psychological world of the subject and the ways in which that world is made small um, and thoughtless by social processes and, um, and censorship and, and, the, um, and reason, I suppose. So the book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, was really a very uh, central text for my own thinking. It led to Marcuse, it led to uh, Eric Fromm, it led to Hannah Arendt, um, it, it led to Herman Melville, it led to a world of, uh, of literature and, um, uh, and, and, a, and a, a deep abiding interest for the status of the conflict in education. Um, I finished uh, my undergraduate work and it was, it was a very radical education that I had uh, at the University of Massachusetts. There were no grades. Um, it was a time of experimentation. The school was uh, desegregated. It was run by um, uh, uh, a dean by the name of Dwight Allen. And Dwight Allen was of the Baha'i faith. And the Baha'is are quite interested in uh, integration. And so um, when Dwight Allen got there at the University of Massachusetts, it was very conservative um, education faculty before Dwight Allen. There was a rule that the dean could not um, inaugurate new courses. The only power that the dean had was that he could cancel courses. So when Dwight Allen got there, he canceled every single course in the faculty of education except one, independent study. He then invited all of the faculty that he wanted to keep on a uh, trip to talk about the reinvention of education. The ones he didn't want, he didn't invite. And eventually, they became isolated and left. He brought in people from New York, people from the New York school system, people who were very key in desegregation. Bill Cosby went there. Roberta Flack went there. People that were thinkers, artists, people out of prison. It was a very lively and interesting um, and radical place. We had courses like Education is Love, sexism, racism, and education. This was in the 70s. And uh, feminism was alive and well, black liberation. Uh, the, the problem of the politics of education was a very key uh, idea. Um, did, did Paolo ever come and visit you? Well, this was, um, Freire was a faculty member at the University of Massachusetts. And so was Bloom. So we had from the right and the left visiting. When I uh, returned uh, for graduate school, and that was in 1983, Paolo had a yearly seminar, which I began to attend. And so I went to his seminars. Whenever he was there, I went to his seminars and got to know him very well. He was very friendly, very open. And uh, I remember the first class I went to, everybody was afraid. And um, he walked into the first class, and he sat down. And he spent a long time t telling us how important it was to take notes. And he described his procedure of taking notes and the notebooks that he carried with him, little notebooks that he carried with him. And that he would um, have an idea, and he would write it down, and then he would play with the idea, and he would take some more notes, and he would listen to people's conversations, and he would take snatches of notes. And from these notes, he began to write. And so there was um, no assignments in the seminar. There were no grades and no, no requirements and no attendance. And one just came. The people in the seminar was interesting. There were people in teacher education. There, mainly the people were in adult education, people in development, people working in, uh, in Latin America, in Africa. Um, 
in Europe. Um, and um, we all came from very different vantages. Uh, there was many languages spoken in the seminar. He worked in Spanish and English and French. Um, and uh, we were just talking. The entire seminar was just whatever was on our minds is what we talked about and tried to make some sense of. Um, he, he, one of the things I remember about Paulo was sometimes he talked about his depression and what he did when he was depressed. And it's probably what we all do if we're lucky when we're depressed, we go shopping. So he was very dapper. He was very handsome. He was very, um, he cared about his dress. He, uh, he was very, very interested. He was very, very funny. Um, and um, he was very, very serious. He had a long beard um, and was um, just a very uh, approachable, interesting, you know, my friend, my friend, he would say, hugging people and so on and, and uh, made us all very comfortable until finally we could have meaningful discussions with him. Um, in 1986, I worked with uh, a couple of uh, my friends who we were in graduate school together. We had all finished around the same time. Uh, Kathy Walsh and Juan Alestia. They're now uh, living in Ecuador. They've been there for probably about 20 years. But we decided um, in 1985 to make a working conference, and we called it the first working conference on critical pedagogy. And we held it at the University of Massachusetts. And it had three strands, and we brought together um, areas that were seen as quite separate in education. Adult education, which primarily the people in adult education and literacy education were very keen, and community education were very keen on Paulo Freire. Teacher education, which didn't really do much with Freire, unless there were people that were very interested in Freire, and feminism. Um, and African-American studies. We brought all of this, this group together. So we invited, we decided to inv invite uh, people that were very known in the area. In Canada, it was Roger Simon was invited, Maxine Green, Paulo Freire, Madeleine Grumet, um, and um, John Bracey, uh, an African-American uh, scholar, um, Henry Giroux, uh, Peter McLaren, um, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody, but what was interesting was that this group of people rarely were in the same room together, Elizabeth Spellman in philosophy. Um, and those folks did keynotes, and then in addition we had um, uh, panels, and uh, the keynotes also, and Paolo, and the keynotes of course had the, um, also came to the panels and moderated the panels and so on. I will, I definitely will, I promise, <laughs> absolutely. So um, it was at, and uh, so I handled the uh, strand in teacher education. And um, it was there that uh, I gave a, a paper um, that ended up being um, a very popular article published in the Harvard Ed Review called Cultural Myths in the Making of a Teacher, Reality and Social Structure in Teacher Education. Um, and some really interesting work came out of that. Uh, Harvard had actually published a special issue about the conference. Max and Green had a paper called In Search of Critical Pedagogy, which was one of the, one of the, op is sort of an opening moment of um, thinking about, thinking about critical pedagogy as something, as a, as a project as opposed to a thing you did something to search for, something that you could, that you could find in, in the national literature, that you could find in art, that you could find in um, people's conversations. It wasn't something that was brought to someone, but it was something that was made and discussed and um, pondered over and thought about. Um, and it was, uh, it was my pleasure to introduce Maxine to Paolo and uh, it's something Maxine still talks about. You know, she's, she's quite old now and she's had many, many birthdays and, you know, has 
has buried many friends, including Paolo. Um, and um, so uh, that was uh, the, those years of were were really a time of where critical pedagogy was in the process of being defined. It was a it was a term that was shocking. It was as shocking to us as um, pedagogy of the oppressed. It's hard to believe now because now critical pedagogy may be so normalized or people speak about it all the time. Although, you know, even today people think about pedagogy and they say, well, what's that? Why don't you just say teaching or why, why do you say, why do you say pedagogy? What is pedagogy? Um, so it's a word that decenters us that we, that we don't know what that word means. Um, and that sometimes we associate it with children, but mainly uh, we associate it with our own education, with our own capacity, our own capacity to learn as the basis of how it is that we teach. That is that we, we teach the way, we teach our style of learning. And that essentially, I learned that from Paulo, that he, he, he didn't teach us content he presented us with a style similar, I would say, to how Lacan teaches. Lacan's work is all oral, and his seminars, his great seminars, Lacan seminars, his 25 seminars that he held from, I would say, 1953 to around 1980, he would come in and he'd say, well, this year the topic is, say, ethics and psychoanalysis, and he would spend the year talking about one thing, and just, and it would be transcribed, and it would be uh, handed out and there would be pirate copies and it would be translated and our seminars from Lacan are his oral teaching so he would and I would say that Paulo as well was we could say based his his work on his oral his oral teaching he talked about his work uh, in the favelas and he um, he talked about uh, how people approached the word and um, similar to the, the signifier in uh, in Lacanian uh, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, or words and things, as 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 Freud would would fr Freud would talk about words and things bother people. I guess I make the I make a leap. Freire, of course, talked about consciousness, and Freud, of course, talked about unconscious, the unconscious. Um, but what brings them both together is their uh, understanding of the status of meaning in human life, in the emotional world. Freire always admitted and that education is an emotional situation. And this question of the emotional situation of the human, the human condition as an emotional situation, the human as having desire, all of those are, are quite psychoanalytic questions. I think Freire was uh, deeply impressed by um, uh, both Fanon, who was a psychiatrist and a, a deep um, admirer of Freudian thought and a deep critic of Freudian thought. And I don't think the two, the, that contradiction of being both a critic and, a, and an admirer is, is something we have to say yes and no to our knowledge. Uh, uh, um, uh, mainly, um, I think that um, what Freud was more interested in isn't what the, sit, the state kept from you, but what you yourself don't know. The subject is unconscious in the Freudian uh, approach, but the, the subject suffers. And that question of suffering is very key in the pedagogy of the oppressed. And what um, eases the suffering, if I understand uh, Freire, and if I understand Freud, is our capacity to think. Because thinking is an experimental form of action. Thinking is the way in which we imagine what isn't here. And that uh, question of the imagination is um, really the grounds of our capacity to read, to project, to take in the world, to um, construct something that has never existed before in the mind, to want, to, de to desire. And this question of desire, I think, is very key in, in pedagogy of the oppressed. Now, the, the, he, Freire was most interested in the existential problem of, of what he called at the time man, right? The existential problem of how to live, 
how to choose freedom, how to um, uh, to let go of constraints, how to um, uh, to risk love, how to work. Those are the key problems that education inherits, and um, whether or not um, there can be a way for education to allow for those kinds of existential explorations is one thing. Freire felt that uh, reading was allowing that procedure, whether there were institutional supports or not, that reading was the thing that freed, um, freed the psyche or allowed the ego its um, grace and its, uh, its flexibility and its uh, imagination. Um, so ideas, the status of ideas, uh, you could see across all of these great thinkers that um, thinking mattered. As Foucault asked that great question, you know, is it really important to think? And um, without thinking, without the capacity to bring things together, to see relationships, to put oneself in another's place, to imagine um, our own feelings to represent, to put things into words. All of those um, uh, procedures are uh, feed love, um, and I think that the that um, Freire was quite interested in questions of education and love. He was quite inter he was quite interested in the the cure of reading, reading as a as a way of of reading the world of 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 um, moving into the latent latency of meaning which brings us back to Freud and in a way one could say if you know a lot about Freud you could say that um, Freud's work of interpretation of dreams is another way of talking about how to read and so this question of reading in the 20th century this question of literacy this question of literature this question of the poetics of thought uh, would link all of these uh, thinkers together although we could say that they are they have such great differences between them but the capacity to um, to see uh, to bring into relief I guess what is latent in their work and to create some new ways of relating these these folks uh, is, is it's something I'm I'm quite interested in in thinking about uh, well, I've, I've known Joe for a very, very long time, and, um, you know, it's very, very sad, a sudden death. I met Joe in um, 1987 in front of an elevator at an educational conference. At the time, he was quite skinny and he had blonde hair and I didn't know him <clears throat> and I was standing by the um, elevator uh, at this was an American Educational Studies Association conference and he comes up to me and he says oh I'm making a little book and I want you to write a chapter for me and the topic will be our teachers as good as they used to be I thought well, well th this is quite interesting he, he was happy he was laughing it was a funny question he says, this is all I, just a few pages is all I want. It's ten questions that are always asked about education. I think this is going to be a really good book. And um, I was with Magda Lewis at the time. We were standing there together. And we both smiled and we both said yes. Uh, but we thought he was kidding. <laughs> and then I get a letter from him and he says, no, you know, this is when we want it. And um, that started uh, my relationship with Joe. And um, I've contributed to many of his uh, collections of his books. And he's been, you know, always just really uh, sweet um, and generous and um, generative. Um, he published uh, in his series, I think I was number 300, my book, Novel Education, that came out a couple of years ago and um, working uh, at, at uh, Peter Lang and um, he published a piece of, in, in the old taboo Her, uh, him and Shirley were editing of course through Bergamo um, I saw Joe the AERA I uh, went to his music uh, and um, 
Yeah, uh, Joe opened the field of education in a way that uh, allowed people their idiom. Um, and he published uh, both new scholars and um, older scholars, and in that sense gave legitimacy to the newer people coming up by have, making sure that there were established uh, names in his, uh, in his series, in many of his many series. Um, I was really happy when he got the recognition he should have gotten much earlier uh, at the American Educational Research Association. There was the Ed Journal, uh, the Ed Researcher had a, uh, a, a discussion of Joe because he, Joe was such a writer. I mean, the guy was always working, he was always writing. He had a, a talent of taking small objects like the hamburger and creating a story of education. He had uh, a great. Uh, educational imagination and uh, generous and funny and uh, and love life and that was evident in everything that he did um, and uh, he he, um, he he built something uh, but didn't um, infuse it with a, a rigid ego if I could put it that way he was very very interested in other people's ideas and took a great deal of pleasure uh, in the world of ideas and and you can't ask for anything better than that in education that, that if we don't love ideas if we don't love freedom if we don't love um, struggle if we don't love each other um, it's uh, it it, it we're no different than um, uh, is as if we've never been here before, and I, I, I think that Joe, you know, made uh, uh, a great work of art of in his life, and his and his uh, and his uh, publications, and you know, we'll the people that are are after Joe, you know, the people that know Joe, we'll, we'll always miss him. We'll always remember Joe as one of the fine, fine thinkers in our field and an innovator um, in education. I would think that um, what I hope what I hope is next, maybe for me, I don't know uh, what's going to be next for other people, but one of the uh, preoccupations that um, may be gaining some renewed interest is the status of emotional life in learning and in ethics. And um, I would hope that psychoanalysis would become um, a, a very interesting um, preoccupation for education to begin to, to notice uh, the emotional world of the student as the basis for their understanding of themselves and others and I would imagine that for teachers in particular understanding uh, a very specific dilemma uh, in the profession of education and that is that and this is the case for the university as well because we were once children who grew up in education and returned to this uh, field as adults we bring to this field our childhood of education and our infantile theories of learning and the, these infantile theories of learning um, are essentially a, a tax on the capacity to think so I would hope that one would think about the emotional situation of critical pedagogy critical pedagogy not only as a a set of ideas about critiquing the world and an understanding of how ideology works and an understanding of problems of inequality but also an understanding of fantasy an understanding of sexuality um, an understanding of desire as also uh, significant to the capacity to think not just about thinking about ideas but being able to tolerate the frustration of being with others to tolerate conflict in education as 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 a constitutive feature of education as, as our split subject to begin to 
think about critical pedagogy not as a set of uh, things to carry out, but as an emotional situation that people must work through. And that, that would allow um, us to begin to tolerate all of our differences um, and, and see what's, um, what's important and what's unimportant. I think we're still at that place where we're not quite sure what's important and what's unimportant, so we're still sort of, we could say, in the Hamlet complex, you know, to be or not to be, or um, we, we want to begin to think about what the unconscious means in, in, in critical pedagogy as well. Uh, as in um, in life, so I would say that critical pedagogy is now ready to begin to think about itself as an emotional situation, as much as an intellectual project, as much as a political project, and begin to um, whittle away uh, binaries uh, of either it's emotional or it's intellectual, blah blah blah, and to begin to see that um, that these um, processes as needed and um, necessary for each of the other's intelligibility. You know, so much has changed um, since I began and um, uh, as a student, as a, as a teacher, as a professor. One of the big ones, of course, is the internet and the accessibility that people now have to ideas. And one of the more difficult dilemmas that education will now inherit will be again to um, sorting through the thicket of uh, information and superstition that, uh, that are associated with these technological uh, innovations and the immediacy of, of uh, knowledge in a way that it wasn't immediate, uh, so immediate. I had to go to the library, I would go to a bookstore and so on. Now I can just go into the internet and find something. And um, I often wonder what the speed, the high speed mentality does to our capacity for patience, for tolerating not knowing, for being suspicious of knowledge in new kinds of ways, um, and uh, the entertainment features of our, of our uh, pedagogical uh, situation. And so I, these are things that I, that I very much wonder about. Um, how that will affect uh, our capacity to, to think um, and to deal with absence um, when s things are so present. This is, this is really one of the, uh, the big questions I have about uh, the, the, the condition of, uh, of mental and emotional life right now.